No. I lived in a community where there was about 30 boys that went into the service. My brother Bill, he, he wanted to go in so bad. He was in the Air Force, along with my other two brothers. They were in the Air Force also. They were all three pilots. He uh, went over to the South Pacific. On the mission that he went on, he got shot down. On Christmas Eve, we got the message. And Bill was killed. It's a beautiful thing to know, even though in the midst of sadness and despair, that your loved ones perished so that we might have the freedoms we have. I would like to express my thanks to all the people all the, the, the men and women that have served our country and have perished so that we might have the freedoms that we have today. As the video said, we are thankful for those that have served our country and given the ultimate sacrifice. Let's give a round of applause to our military. Great. Let's all stand. There is coming a day will there be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more tears. All will be peace. Let's sing the song, There is Coming a Day, number 762. Excuse me, what a day that will be. Not the other one. Here we go. There is coming a day. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day. When my Jesus I shall see, when I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. There'll be no sorrow. Let's sing that song, What If It Were Today. Here we go, number 759, if you have a song book with you. Jesus is coming to earth again. What if it were today? Coming in power.
Satan's dominion will be your all that it were today. Sorrow and sighing shall be no more, all that it were today. Then shall the dead in Christ arise, caught up to
extended and complete. Jesus died, my soul to save. My lips shall still repeat. Cause Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. White as snow. Oh, sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow.
Hi, I'm Amy, and we are so thankful that you could join us this weekend. If you are new to East Auburn or are joining us online, please visit eabc.me slash connect so that we can connect with you. Here's what's happening at East Auburn. If you are a member of East Auburn, mark your calendar for our next business and budget meeting on Sunday, June 6 at 12.30 p.m. We'll be voting on the budget and welcoming new members. We look forward to seeing you there. Are you interested in volunteering for Vacation Bible School or other children's ministries? The next protection policy training will be held on June 8th at 6 p.m. This training is required for those working with children. Summer is here and our youth are gathering. Starting in June, those who will be in sixth grade this fall can join the junior high youth group on Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. And those going into ninth grade can join us for senior high youth group on Sundays at 6.30 p.m. Young adults ages 18 through 25 are meeting at Pastor Craig and Aaron's home on Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m. If you have questions, please email Pastor Craig. We are looking for a few people to help with the outdoor service on Sundays. This team will help with setup and tear down technology equipment. See Matt after the service if you are interested. CareNet helps make decisions about unexpected pregnancies. They are collecting donations from Mother's Day through Father's Day. We still have bottles available in the lobby if you are interested, and you can return them to the church office. Thank you so much for your faithful giving. You can give easily online at eabc.me slash give, on your phone using the EABC app, or you can place your offering in the boxes as you leave the service. If you would like prayer, please come to the front of the sanctuary at the end of the service where someone will pray with you, or you can add your request to the prayer chain by emailing prayer at eabc.me. Thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoy the rest of the service. Well, good morning, East Auburn Baptist Church. Uh, a lot of you know who I am. For those of you who don't, my name is Ethan Foss, and we have the wonderful privilege, my wife Laura and our two kiddos, to be partnered with East Auburn Baptist Church in the furthering and the building of God's church. We want to thank you so much for that. Uh, I am, for those of you who don't know, I'm Isaac's older brother, so there's the family connection there as well. And it's our privilege to be here, and thank you so much for your continued dedicated commitment uh, to support us through prayer and through financial support. Laura and I, by God's grace, will hopefully be moving to the country of Portugal 
in about two and a half months. And we had the privilege this past week of going to the consulate in Boston and submitting our visa application. So things are rolling, things are happening. It's definitely surreal, uh, but it's very exciting for us to be here. And we have the privilege of being part of the missions organization ABWE, which is the Association of Baptists for World Evangelism. Uh, it's been 95 years ago since it was started, and it began in the Philippines with a mission statement that sounds very simple, and yet when you really get into it, it's so complex. And that is to fulfill the Great Commission by multiplying leaders, churches, and missions movements among every people. What I love so much about ABWE is it's not a a North American missions organization that goes into any country with its flag and plants it in the ground and says, we know what we're doing and we're going to tell you what to do. But rather, it's such an amazing, humble group of people that do their homework, they do their research, they say, what is God already doing at work in that country? How can we take our people, our resources, our experience, and come alongside of national churches and leaders to build God's church? Ultimately, uh, Laura and I sense God's direction, his preparingness, his shaping us for church planting. For Pauline style, if I dare say, little a apostolic church planting, we're going into an area where the gospel is not known. Proclaiming the gospel, building relationships, building together a core group, and preaching and teaching and leading worship for a while, but ultimately training national replacements to take over the helm of the spiritual leadership of churches. So we're going to the country of Portugal, which is unreached. Evangelical Christianity, when it puts their statistics and their figures together, places Portugal in the 1040 window as an unreached country, meaning poor economy, lack of Christians, and lack of Christian resources. So they put Portugal and Greece as two European countries with North Africa, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia as an unreached country. Because in Portugal, of 10.3 million people, 85% of them have never heard the gospel. In a country of 10.3 million people, only 0.4%, less than one half of 1%, profess to be evangelical Christian. Even more dire than that, included in that less than one half of 1% are churches that teach a prosperity gospel, Mormons, and Jehovah's Witnesses. Maybe 10,000, 7 or 8,000 true Christians in that country. And they are crying out, the pastors are crying out for assistance, for pastors, for, for ministry leaders, for servants, because in that country there are only 19 what we might consider an evangelical, Bible-proclaiming, Bible-believing church. And in this country that has been for so long so wrapped up in relationship and community and belonging, that is shattered. Because right now the country of Portugal has a divorce rate of 75%. So I asked a missionary friend of ours who's been there for several years, I said, so in light of earning great, building relationships to share the gospel, and planting churches in light of the broken, broken reality of this country, what's the avenue through which you use to share the gospel? And he said, we teach the biblical view and beauty of adoption, that there is a perfect and loving father who desires to have an intimate relationship he said, opens up the floodgates of emotion. Being a husband and a wife, being a family unit with more than one child, walking through life in front of the Portuguese people, brings the question, why? Why are you different? And that's how we can get in and share the gospel. So we're very excited, like I said, hopefully uh, in the next two, two and a half months to move to Portugal. I want to thank you so much for your continued support. There's still a little bit of a ways to go. So I want to uh, appeal to you, perhaps as individuals, that you would pray and see how God might lead you to partner with us through prayer, uh, potentially financially. And we have some prayer cards. We have some information on the back table. Please stop in, uh, grab some of that. And uh, we're actually going to have my, have my wife and kiddos uh, come up so you can see their beautiful faces. Our mission committee will come on up, please. I don't know how many we have that are here this morning. We have at least three of them. And uh, congratulations to you all on your faithful yielding to the Spirit of God as he has moved you. Um, and it's been kind of an up and down. Where, God, do you want us to go? 
and uh, not our will, but thy will be done, and uh, you've, you've done that, and uh, God has blessed you with a beautiful family. We as a church, we um, are privileged uh, to be in a partnership with young couples like this, and uh, I quite frankly would not want to be in a church that doesn't send out missionaries. We have some 30 families, individuals and families that minister around the world, and all of you are part of their ministry as they go to Portugal, as we support East Auburn and our mission program. 10% of our, um, of our uh, income each year uh, we seek to give to missions. Now, we do more than that, but directly from uh, our planned giving and support, uh, $140,000 plus will go uh, to uh, missionaries uh, and their service around the world. And uh, so um, our prayers are, our prayers are going to be with you. We have the privilege of praying over them today. And uh, I, I was reminded in the book of Acts chapter, hey, buddy, he's ready to preach, sing, dance. Hi. Yeah, how are you, buddy? Uh, yeah. Both of you, yeah, and his sweet sister. Um, the uh, book of Acts chapter 13, it tells us, really gives a picture of of uh, the, the ministry and the Holy Spirit uh, leading Paul and Barnabas. And it says they laid their hands on them and sent them out. And so um, that's what we do with you today, guys. And uh, God bless you. Our prayers are with you. And um, I'll have a couple of you pray, and then I'll close in prayer. So uh, go right ahead, Pat, start us off, please. Thanks. Lord God, we do come to you and we thank and praise you that you have called Ethan and Laura to missions to serve you wherever in the world you want them to go. Lord, we pray for these next two and a half months. We know that it is very, very difficult to pack up everything you have, everything you will need, and have two small children to go along with that. We pray, Lord, that you'd give them wisdom, that you would guide them as they take this out of the drawer or that out of the drawer and decide whether it's going to go or whether it's going to stay. Lord, we pray that you'd give them peace in their heart as they leave family and friends and go to a new place. And Lord, we do pray that their life in front of those people in Portugal would cause them to ask, why did this couple come here? What is different about them? And Lord, we pray that you'd give them opportunity to tell those Portuguese people exactly what caused them to come. And we pray that many will accept the Lord because of their faithfulness to you. Lord, we pray that you'd not only go with them, but give them the assurance that they are where you want them to be. Thank you, Lord, for all that you're going to do through them. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, we thank you for this precious family that's willing to travel to other parts of the world to, to tell others about your love. I pray, God, that you go before them, that you make the way easy for them, that they're traveling with the children will be comfortable, God. And I just pray a special blessing on this family, Lord, that is willing to serve you in, un or in territories they've never been before. God, I just pray that you'll protect them and bless them. Bless them abundantly as they arrive there, Lord. And we just praise you and thank you in your holy, precious name. Amen. Lord, thank you for bringing this couple together. You formed them, you made them, and created them. Yes. And uh, you had prepared them for each other, bringing them <laughs> together and calling them uh, to the work of the ministry of Christ. Um, Lord, um, thank you for preparing them for Portugal, and um, I pray, God, that you'd go before them, as the scripture says, your hand is before them and behind them, that you hold them. Pray, God, that you'd bless them as they go, give them grace, give, Lord God, them the strength they need and the wisdom and discernment as they begin their ministry. I pray you'd guide them and direct them. Lord, I pray that you'd give them fellowship because, Lord God, you said it's not good that they should be alone. They can have you fully, but they still need each other and they need others. So bless them with friendships and relationships, Lord. Open the doors, uh, the door for the gospel, as Paul said, 
pray, pray Lord, that you'd open doors and um, that many would come to Jesus because of them. Lord, that they would be edified, the body of Christ would be built up, that they, Lord, uh, would um, evangelize and give the gospel and bring glory to you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And God bless you guys. And uh, praise the Lord. Thank you. So when you're talking about the end times, I think the thing that is stirs up in a lot of men and women's minds, specifically if they've never really studied or dug into it, is kind of apocalyptic, kind of dragons, book of Revelation. What does this mean? There's no way to really know. And I, and, and I think the thing to consider about the end times is that the end times and staring into our future as believers in Jesus Christ is all about hope. That's what it's about, that, that we have hope for our souls, that they uh, live eternally with our Savior. We have hope for our bodies as our bodies ache and, and grow old and wear out. We have this reminder, and we see it in 1 Corinthians 15, and we see it also in Revelation, that we'll have physical resurrected bodies that don't perish, that can't get sick. And then we have hope for our world, this broken world that we're in, that in the, um, that in the reign and rule of Christ in and throughout eternity, in the future and throughout e eternity is one where uh, all things have been made new uh, and that our hope is not something that's in front of us anymore, but that's something that we're actively participating in every second of our being. So that is a hope for our soul, but a hope for our physical body and also a hope for our planet. Now, uh, when we think about the details around that, that that's where uh, people start to divide into camps and start to kind of argue back and forth. I want to say that that I think that this is a good thing to study, a good thing to dive into, but there's a level of mystery here that God has allowed, even as he has revealed to us in the word of God, uh, that there is something around the millennial reign of Christ. When we're talking about the end times, what we're talking about is Christian hope and where the Christian's hope should be placed. And so listen, just to encourage you at the end of this very short uh, video, uh, our souls are secure. Uh, our bodies will be made new. And and, and our earth, this, this earth of ours, will be recreated and, and will be what it was meant to be, uh, covered with the glory of God, established in the order that God intended for the glory of God and for our joy forever in ever increasing joy. And that's something to hope in. All right. One of my staff saw that and uh, thought that'd be a good opener, I think it is, listening to Matt Chandler. Some of you might know him, a great communicator, wonderful man of God. He was here at East Auburn a number of years ago and uh, was great when he was here and um, kind of sets the table. What we're going to talk about this morning is what we believe about final events. What do we believe about final events? We're really going to talk about one particular final event this morning. And um, that one event that we're going to talk about is the return of Christ, the return of Christ. That of all the events um, that you need to uh, know about in final events, one of the things you need to know and believe with conviction, as we've talked about, what do you believe, that that belief is supposed to be one that moves you, motivates you, and makes a difference in your life. If you say you believe something, but it doesn't make a difference in your life, it's not biblical belief. Biblical belief, biblical faith, is one that results in works, results in activities. Faith without works, the Bible says, is what? Dead. Faith without works is dead. Say, I believe something, but it doesn't translate into action, is not a biblical belief. What do you believe about final events. Now, this morning we do have kids in our service still, and we're glad that they're here. We welcome them, and uh, they're looking for three words this morning. Uh, in the, uh, Jesus, the word come again, or words come again, and then the words be ready. Jesus, come again, 
and be ready. So I've just said it twice, all of those. So they're going to be putting checks on their sheet as they listen for those words throughout the sermon. Now, as we talk about the return of Christ, uh, this series has, we've covered a lot of things in this series. What do we believe about the Bible? What do we believe about God, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, mankind, salvation, the church, and our last of our what do we believe series is final events one sunday uh, and we're we're just beginning a conversation about each of these things and hopefully you have uh, developed uh, what you believe about these eight things and this morning hopefully you're going to begin to think about what you believe about final events i do believe that the talking about final events especially about the return of christ is an encouragement uh, it should lift you and, and uh, inspire you to live better because of the soon return of Jesus. Um, through the last 2,000 years, the church has talked about and sung about the return of Jesus Christ. It's kind of like when your parents go away. One of the things my parents always said to me is we could return at any time. And they would never tell me exactly when they were going to return. And so I would have to really be careful about what I was doing when they came back. And I'd always try to figure out what I could get away with between uh, the time they left and the time I thought they might return. The return of my parents always uh, caused me to uh, change my behavior when I knew they were coming back. I wanted to have things ready, the house cleaned up, and be doing things that would make them happy. Well, the return of the Lord has that kind of sobering effect upon each and every one of us. Now, the outline we're going to follow this morning for uh, this, this part of our teaching is that the fact that Jesus is coming again, we're going to look at we're going to look at in the verse of Scripture, there's one key verse that I think really brings summary. It tells us He's going to return, and it tells us our response. And uh, Revelation 22, verse 20, surely I am coming quickly, and John's response is, amen, <laughs> amen. <laughs> it's a good thing, he said. Uh, he was excited about the return of Christ. Surely I am coming quickly. And John says, Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. And we should be in a relationship, a loving relationship with the Lord. One of the things we sang in that last song that Cody led us in, uh, the Revelation song, there's a little phrase in that where we say, You are my everything and I will adore you. Most of you sang that to Jesus this morning. It always kind of, I always kind of stumble on that a little bit because I know that often Jesus is not my everything. And he knows that. And so it's always convicting to me when I, when I sing that. It, it challenges me. Maybe you too. You are my everything and I, because of that, I adore you. We should have an intimate love relationship with Jesus as his children. There should be an intim intimacy and a love. And someone you love, you want to see. I remember when I was first in love with my wife. First time we had to be really apart apart. I was in Michigan. She was in New Jersey. I remember sitting at a... At a, at a restaurant in Roosevelt, uh, in uh, Roosevelt Park, uh, Michigan. I was with my parents, and I was away from her, and I started to cry at the table. I felt kind of foolish, but I adored her, and I wanted to be with her. It worked because my dad paid for an airline ticket and flew her out. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't comfortable with my emotion. He was so uncomfortable that he said, all right, I'll buy her a ticket and have her come out. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> but it wasn't fake. It was real. I adored her and loved her and wanted to. No, she's not in here. I don't think this way. Everybody's looking around. Where's Barb? <laughs> she's interpreting for a deaf person. 
for a service up north, and so she's watching the service and on a screen interpreting it for a deaf person. So if you wonder what the pastor's wife's doing, that's what she's doing this morning in our office area. She's helping one of our deaf community um, individuals that's going through a very difficult time right now. He has ALS, and he's only 30-some, 40 years old with three little kids, and he has a short time on earth, and so you can pray for him, all right? That'd be a great, that's a great prompter. But I, because of our love for Jesus, we should want to see him. He has loved you and loved me with an infinite love. He gave everything. It cost him everything for us to have relationship with our holy heavenly father and with Christ in the presence of the spirit cost Jesus everything. And we're going to see this morning that he promises he's going to return. We're going to look at what our response should be and then the reward for those that have the right attitude towards Christ's return. The fact that it is a positive is noted in Titus uh, chapter 2 and verse 13. Titus 2.13 says that we're looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be looking for, anticipating, alert, looking for that blessed hope. Some of you don't have that hope before you, and I'm, I'm going to encourage you this morning to to grow in your spiritual life, to understand that He is, He has promised that He is coming again and that it would become a blessed hope. The word hope means uh, a confident assurance of something that's going to happen. You anticipate something with a confidence. It's called a blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We should have an anticipation of excited anticipation of that. Uh, in Philippians 3 and verse 20, the fact that the return of Christ is to be a positive is noted there where Paul says in Philippians 3 20, for our citizenship is in heaven. This world, remember the old hymn, this world is not our home. We're just passing through. And some of us have fallen in love with this world, and it's robbed us of an anticipation of the return of Christ, a love for Christ. You can't love one and the other, the scripture says. You can't have two loves. In 1 John 2 15, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If anyone love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Doesn't mean we can't enjoy life. We're not talking about not enjoying life, not a killjoy, amen? Uh, God's given us life, a gift in the capacity and desire for enjoyment and pleasure. I'm not preaching and teaching against that. Nothing wrong with having things as long as things don't have you. <laughs> Amen? Amen? It's okay. God, God's blessed, richly blessed you. Uh, the scripture says in Ecclesiastes 5, not only does he give us what we have, but he gives us the ability and capacity to enjoy it. So you can have a lot, not enjoy it. Or you can have less and enjoy it immensely. That's the gift of God, the scripture says. He gives us the ability. Solomon says that, Ecclesiastes 5, and I don't have the exact verse, but it's at the very end of that chapter. And it says God's given you life and the ability to, given you everything you have and the ability to enjoy it. So you have a little bit and really, really enjoy it. And you have a lot and be miserable. Ask God's blessing on everything that you have that you would enjoy it. For our citizenship is in heaven from which we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Eagerly wait. Lord, warm our hearts. Help us to love you again and desire, desire to be with you and to see you. Amen? That's a good prayer on a Sunday morning. What well, Part of what we're doing is, part of the reason you come to church is to adjust, make adjustments and get things lined back up and get things in order and that's a good thing. That's, I want you to benefit from coming. And for some, it's, it's realigning and readjusting. And we've fallen in love with this world. This world is our home. Well, so our outline, the coming of Jesus again. Number one, uh, he has promised that he is going to return. In the Gospel of John chapter 14, 
verse 1, he speaks about the fact in the, in the gospel, about in the ver- chapter before this, about leaving, that he's going to be leaving. And he said to them, let not your heart be troubled. They were troubled. He wanted to calm them. He was talking about leaving. They were bummed out. They were discouraged. They were disappointed. And he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Verse 2. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. And here's the promise in verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will what? Come again. (laughs) I'll come again. Jesus made a promise. He's going to come again. He came the first time right on time. Galatians 4.4 says, in the fullness of time. He came right on time the first time. And he promises that he's going to come again and receive us to himself, that where he is, there we may be also. So he says here, I'm going to come again. This was not only said by Jesus, but it was also said by the angels after his death, burial, and resurrection, and his 40 days of ministry before he ascended to the right hand of God the Father, when he was ascending in the book of Acts, chapter 1, and we'll pick up at verse 9. Acts 1, verse 9. Now, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up in a cloud, received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. They were angels. Verse 11. Who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, listen to this, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So not only did Jesus says, says, I'll come again, but also the angels said, I will come again. He made promise, and this is where he, one of the places he really emphasizes the fact that he is going to come again. In the book of Revelation, in Revelation 22, the last chapter of the Bible. And if you have a Bible, I encourage you to turn to Revelation 22 and look at verse 7. Revelation 22 and verse 7. Jesus is speaking to John. And he says, Behold, I'm coming quickly. There it is. Behold, John. (laughs) It's 2,000 years ago. We'll have a text in a few moments that'll talk about the fact of how God sees time and we see time as very different. In reference to eternity, 2,000 years is nothing. Scripture says that, uh, you know, a thousand years is like a what? A day. And a day like a thousand years. Why? In, in, in eternity, time will be no more. There is no time, it's eternal, no beginning. <laughs> God's eternal. The only thing that's eternal is God. No beginning. Always has been. No end. So, he made, here Jesus is telling John on the Isle of Patmos, behold, I'm coming quickly. The word quickly means speedily, without delay. He says, blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Look at verse 12. Jesus says something again to John. Behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to everyone, uh, to give to everyone according to his work. And then in verse 20 of the same chapter, again, Jesus says this. He who testifies to these things, Jesus, says, surely, I am coming quickly. Now, the next words leads us to our next point. What should our response be? What should our response be? Oh, good. Thank you. I was like, why are they all saying amen? (laughs) They were reading. I'm sorry. They were more with me than I was with me, all right? (laughs) This leads us to the next point in our outline. Number one, the promise of his return. 
He says, I'm going to come again. Jesus said it. We can believe him. He's going to come again. Scriptures are clear. We don't know when, but he's going to come again. That's important to know of final events. The final event that we need to be aware of this morning, I believe for East Auburn, as I prayed over all the final events I could talk about. He led me to say, we need to know that he's, this church needs to know he's coming again. Don't, don't put your stakes down too deeply here. And you know what? Let me just make a quick note. One of two things is going to happen. For many of us, we're going to go to him before he comes to us. Scripture says, life is but a vapor. Peers for a time and then it vanishes and is no more. Uh, Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 3, 2, there's a time to be born and a time to what? It's going to happen. Young, old. I did four funerals last week. Do a funeral this afternoon. Do a burial on Friday. Do a burial on Saturday. Death is ever present in a world of people. One day, you and I, moment of time, can go and step into eternity. Some of you families know that truth all too well. Many of us are going to meet him soon. And we're going to talk about how to be ready. And let me just say the first step of readiness for his return is to receive him as Lord and Savior into your life. The Bible says he came on to his own, but his own received him not. But to as many as received him, he gave the right to become the children of God, part of the family of God. That's the gospel, and that's the first step of preparation for his return is to be, as Jesus says in John 3, to Nicodemus, a very religious guy. He needed to be born again. He needed a new, spirit, a new life, a spiritual life. Bible says that we were born in trespasses and sin. We were dead in trespasses and sin, Ephesians 2, 1 says. Bible says the wages of sin is death. The cost of sin is death. What kind of death? Spiritual death, separation from God. Often the eyes of the church people glass over when I give the gospel. If you don't have, if you've never received Christ, take that first step. That's your preparation to be ready to receive him. To believe and receive. It's a, it's a gift of God. It's grace. We're saved by the grace of God. It's a gift of God. And all you have to do is receive, believe, take your first step of faith, and begin your journey with him. Then you're a child of God ready for Christ to come again. So following that, we know that he's promised to return. What is our response? Well, our response is exactly what this verse says. In Revelation 22, 20, he testifies these things. Surely I'm coming quickly. And John says, amen. <laughs> amen. <laughs> What's that mean? Yes. So we should all say that this morning. When Jesus says, surely I am coming quickly, we say what? Amen. amen. All of us should say amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And be ready. Now, I... I hiccup on that a little bit. There's a little speed bump in my spiritual life that says, I want him to come, but I don't know how ready I am. That has in reference to me living and stewarding my life in absolute obedience. Maybe some of you can relate to that to go, uh, I'd like a few more days to, to be more of what he created me to be and do what he's called me to do. It's a bit of a, even though I'm ready for him to come, it would be like my parents came a little early and I wasn't quite ready. I had a few more things I needed to pick up and throw away, <laughs> clean up. I feel that way in reference to the Lord. I do say, I want to say, amen, even so, come Lord Jesus. The fact that his coming should prepare us is noted in Ro Romans chapter 13. And if you haven't turned to any other text, turn there. We're going to be in Romans 13, 11 through 14 for a few minutes this morning. Romans 13, 11 through 14. 
gives five things that you need to do because of Christ's return. Romans 13, 11 says, and do this knowing, that the, knowing the time that now is high time to awake out of sleep for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Number one, in verse 11, wake up. Knowing the time. Because we know the time is soon. Wake up. Be alert. I don't want a fellowship, a congregation, where the pastor lulled everybody to sleep. And you say, well, quit being so boring. (laughs) I'll work on that, okay? But I want you to be awake and alert. Ready. Wake up. (laughs) No. Out of your sleep, for salvation is near. 55 years ago, over 55 years ago, I came to Christ. I'm 55 years closer to meeting Jesus. The time is nearer than it once was. Amen? Amen. We believe that to be true. We look at world events, the way things, the things have been, and we go, man, things seem to be moving towards. We should know the time. Now it's high time to awake out of sleep. Verse 12, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly, verse 13. As in the day, not in reverie, not in drunkenness, not in lewdness or lust, not in strife or envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. The five things noted here. Number one, wake up, verse 11. Number two, verse 12, cast off the works of darkness. Number three out of verse 12, put on the armor. Suit up. Read read Ephesians 6, beginning with verse 10, where it says, you know, be strong in the Lord, the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Go through the pieces of armament. (laughs) Put them on. (laughs) Breastplate of righteousness. Christ's righteousness, but also living righteously. Take the sword of the Spirit. Armor up. Suit up. Put on the armor. Verse 12. Verse 13. Number 4. Walk properly. Number 5. Verse 14. Put on Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Well, this leads us to the the last thing, which is the reward. In Revelation 22, 12, Jesus said, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me. Revelation 22. 22 and verse 12, behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Well, the child of God that's doing a good work is going to be rewarded. Amen? Amen. Amen. And, and let me just say, you're, you're in a good place this morning, taking a good step. Some of you wondered whether you should come. Rainy day, kind of cold. Doesn't take much for us to say, I think I'll just stay in bed a little longer. (laughs) Right? It's that kind of day. But you're in a good place. I hope that you're receiving the word. The Spirit of God is taking the word and giving it to you. And you're ready to move forward in faith and obedience to him. I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me. In 2 Timothy... 4.8, 4.8, it says, finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not to me only, but to all who have loved his appearing. Loving his appearing makes a big difference. You love his appearing. You love him, and you can't wait to see him. I love him, and I can't wait to see him. Some say, I need to work on that love piece need to nurture it. Love has to be nurtured. You can be married to someone but not love them very much because you haven't nurtured your love. For child of God, we can do a lot of things that draw us away from loving him first and foremost. There is a reward, a, a crown of righteousness for those that have loved his appearing. 
And it's noted in Paul's teaching there in Scripture. A reward has been promised. So, how ready are you for the return of Christ? Do you, do you believe what he said, I'll come again? Have you responded and saying, even so, come Lord Jesus, and responded and saying, I'm going to have my life in order that if he were to return today, that there would be no sense of shame, there would be no disappointment on his part. He would say what is said in Matthew uh, 25 when uh, the stewards are, rip, are turning back the things that God had given them and he says to the faithful stewards, well done, good and faithful servants. Enter into the joy of the Lord. That each of us would say, Lord, I'm going to commit myself to steward everything you've given me. And you say, is it possible to mismanage the grace of God? I'm going to have you put up, if you will, for my last verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 10. And the answer to that question is yes. 10. 50 is good, but 10 is better. Paul says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. Everything he gave me was not a waste. But I labored more abundantly than them all, not I, but the grace of God that is with me. All of us have been given the grace of God, the grace to save us, the grace to serve, the grace of blessings that we now steward for his glory and his honor. Lord, help us to be ready for your return. I pray this in Christ's name, amen. And uh, the altars will be open. If you need prayer, um, you're welcome to come forward. Thanks.